hello everyone thanks for joining us today my name is brett wright i appreciate everyone coming out today to join us for our sports diplomacy panel and now i'm going to pass it over to our moderator mike o'neill thank you brett thank you and i just want to let everyone know this session is going to be recorded so for those that are participating live thank you for being here and i'm confident they're going to be hundreds others who are going to watch this over time because the topic we're speaking about is so important. So good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to those Zooming in from all corners of the world. My name is Michael Neal, and I like to call myself the Chief Amplifier and Results Elevator for my consulting clients. I'm truly, truly grateful to be here today and thank Roy Kessel and the Sports Philanthropy World Team for making this conference happen. Your work is ambitious and important, and to reiterate, your mission is to assist athletes, teams, leagues, and other sports organizations to harness the power of sports to do good things in their communities through social change, education, opportunity, empowerment, and other social causes. Today, we're going to be talking about sports diplomacy, and I'm truly humbled to moderate this esteemed panel of people making such a positive impact, and it's truly happening across the globe. Um, before I begin with some more background, just in, from an administrative perspective, we're going to hold all questions off until the end. And our you know, friends at the conference are going to be helping me moderate and get those questions into the queue and helping ask them. And today, for those that are here, if we did our job right on this panel, we want you to walk away with insight on the following. How to bridge the gap between pro athletes and youth sports. Why collaboration leads to one plus one equals three or three if you're a global person, when it comes to service work, sport for good, social change and impact, and why social change is truly a team sport that makes a difference. I wanna share some perspective taken from the website of our panelists. Um, and these are direct quotes just to show some of the amazing work that they've been doing. We believe it is an economic and moral imperative to create new opportunities for our young people. In an effort to inspire short and long-term change, we are working harder and smarter than ever before. Sport in its simplest form is one of the most extraordinary of human activities and provides participants with the opportunity to stretch their physical and mental limits, share common values and experiences. And lastly, although stories of division, hate, intolerance and natural disaster have dominated headlines as of late, another reality is present. Sport has the power to rebuild communities and strengthen the bonds that connect us to others. Now, to our amazing panelists, uh, first is Sarah Hillier. Sarah is the director and clinical assistant professor and founder of the University of Tennessee's Center for Sport, Peace, and Society, housed in their College of Education, Health, and Human Services. The center was recognized by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton as the sole cooperative partner of the State Department to create a global initiative to empower women, girls, and persons with disabilities through sport. Matt Lawrence, besides like me being a member of the Two First Name Club, is the co-founder of Lawrence International. And before the life-changing work he does there, Matt graduated from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And after graduation, Matt, on, Matt went on to play four seasons in the National Football League, the NFL, for those that aren't familiar. He played with Seattle Seahawks, the Chicago Bears, and the Baltimore Ravens before retiring in 2012. While playing, Matt was involved with the Presidential Council for Fitness and Nutrition, where he volunteered his time to make a strong impact in the young lives of those who looked up to him. Wanting to make more of a global impact, Matt attended the Wharton School of Business. There he was able to gain the critical information needed to have a sustainable model that we see today. And Philip Leopold, last but no less important than the other panelists, has had an over 20 year career in the business of sports. Definitely check out his LinkedIn profile and you're gonna be wowed. Currently, he represents the sport at the service of humanity, which is a foundation affiliated with the Vatican. More specifically, he's working on behalf of the Pontifical Council for Culture. I just 
blows me away. Wow. Their mission is to combine the world's passion for sport with the values of faith to inspire global collaboration, involvement, and inclusion. And I guess one of the big questions that everyone has is what, what is sport diplomacy? The Oxford University Press states that sport diplomacy is a new term that describes an old practice, the unique power of sport to bring people, nations, and communities closer together via shared love of physical, pursu physical pursuits. In other words, sports diplomacy is all about forging connections with others. And now I wanna throw it out to our panelists. I, I'd like each of you to talk about an initiative one that you've worked on recently that you're most proud of, where sports diplomacy made a positive impact on our respective community. And Sarah, why don't I let you go first? Uh, well, thank you so much for the warm introduction and just for this amazing panel. Uh, I would say for us, what we are most proud of is in 2012, when we were awarded the contract with the US State Department's Sports Diplomacy Division, um, the idea was to use the power of mentorship uh, as well as sport and social entrepreneurship to help equip sports leaders around the world see sport as a solution to pressing social challenges facing their local communities. And in fact, Philip and I were just talking about this last week, that of the 209 women and men who have come through this five-week mentorship program from 86 countries, the success rate, we'll call it, those that go back and implement their action plans for social change using sport, 86% um, of them have enacted their action plans. And to know the challenges that they go back to, the challenges that they face, uh, Matt, you spoke of it earlier, there's government challenges and funding challenges and all of that. Uh, they are truly making a remarkable difference um, and owning it for their own communities. So I would say that's what we're most proud of. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that and in adding the data that helps qualify and quantify the impact of your work. Uh, Philip, what you were just mentioned, why don't you, you go ahead next? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't even underscore the shocking number that Sarah just shared with us. That's just, it's fantastic. It, I mean, if you had accomplished, if half of those people had gone home and done some good work, you'd still be proud. So it's, it is, it's just, it's fantastic. Uh, uh, Michael, thank you for having me. Sarah and Matt, it's great to see you and be part of this panel. Uh, I'd say what we, what we are probably proudest of is and may always be uh, the first global conference on faith and sport at the service of humanity in 2016. It's been five years, but it was sort of the microcosm of sports diplomacy in action. It, it was Pope Francis, Thomas Bach from the IOC, and at the time, Ban Ki-moon was Secretary General of the United Nations. Those three uh, decided to host a global conference and try to and, and invite the world of sport and the world of faith to have three days together um, to just meet and facilitate dialogue. And what came out of that is, is a laundry list of organic great work and relationships all over the world. So. I always say sort of jokingly, never underestimate the power of a good cocktail party. This was a global cocktail party that introduced, that really inspired partnerships all over the world. And we've spent the last five years nurturing those partnerships, trying to extend them and find more. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Matt, why don't you talk about one of the recent accomplishments that, that you've had or one of your recent initiatives that made a positive impact in the communities you're serving? Sure, sure. So again, thank you for having me. Thank you for having us on here. Um, you know, the goal is to make a positive change through sports. And that, I believe that everybody's heart is in it. If you're attending this, you know, that's what you're here for. Um, if we weren't speaking, we'd probably be attending it too. So you guys, you're in a, you're in a good place to be. Um, I'd say one of my uh, uh, programs that I was most um, proud of was in 2018, our first year, kind of what kicked off our our nonprofit was, um, we had a youth development uh, symposium and we took kids from the west side of Baltimore, which is one of the worst neighborhoods in the country. And we brought the mid a middle school basketball team 
to uh, the Four Seasons downtown Baltimore. And what we do is we have um, what we call local celebrities and big celebrities. The local celebrities are your CFOs, your doctors, your lawyers, your contractors, your store owners, and your CFOs. Um, and we have the big celebrities, which is your, your, your Orioles, your Ravens, and the big celebrities that are from Baltimore. And we have a panel, just similar how we do, how we're doing right now. And what we do is we talk about tangible steps on how do you achieve leadership and success, and what does that mean from your 14-year-old body sitting in your seats all the way to what to the, to the position that we're in. And we have these, uh, uh, you know, sometimes millionaires and big-time celebrities talk about that and ask car ask car questions. But the most important part is them answering and telling the young students questions and uh, statements about where, where they were at 14, 15. So they can say, oh, wait a minute, you didn't have your life all together. You weren't the president of some Fortune 500 company at 14. Like, no, absolutely not. This is where we were. And this is how we got to where we are today. It didn't just come in a straight line. There were ups and downs. And through it all, we, uh, we made it happen. And in football, in the NFL, we like to say, if you... Um, if you look good, you, you play good. So we got all the young men suits. So we got them suits, ties, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, some of them never had, have never owned suits. Uh, they come in with their suits to the Four Seasons, 28th floor, looking over the whole uh, city. They felt good, they felt inspired, and they got to learn from some of the biggest names in the area and some of the biggest names in the world. And it, it just meant so much to me for them to be able to just be there. I was just like, whoa, like, I just, I just I love the smiles in the young, in the young men's faces. That's uh, that's amazing. And for those that are, that are on the call, you know, those that are they're hiding behind your, your Zoom video camera off, would love to see you if you want to show your faces. And if even if you don't want to show your faces and you want to use some of the, the, the Zoom reactions just to applaud this life changing work, would, would love to see you. Um, so three of you, thank you for sharing those. And my next question is going to be for, for you, Matt. It's sort of a, a follow on what you just described. Sure. In, in your professional career, and even in your collegiate career, you played before, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that filled the stands um, from UMass all the way through, through the NFL. And you have that cachet of being a pro athlete. And I know, Philip, you're working with, of all people, the Pope. <laughs> um, Sarah, you worked with someone named Hillary Clinton that maybe a few of us have, have, have heard of before. How have you and your organizations bridged the gap between your own celebrity or those that you're working with to get down and get, get to work? How do you overcome that, oh, wow, being starstruck? How do you overcome that, all right, we're just an ordinary person like you with a normal background. We're all here to you know, serve humanity for the better. You, you wanted me to go first, right? Please. All right, so for me, it's easier because I'm not a super mega star. Mega star. Um, and so usually at a lot of our big events, what I do is I stand in the crowd. You know, I have a, a host who goes out there and does this thing, um, a moderator just like yourself, they do, they do their thing. And then they, you know, I, I talk and I mingle out in the lobby with people and see why they're here and having a good time. And then once the, uh, the program starts, it's, oh, we want to introduce you to our founder, Matt Lawrence. And it's like, that guy? <laughs> right? That guy? I, just, I was talking to him in the lobby. And so bringing everything down, right? Bring everything down to, to, to normal level, interacting with people. The more you interact, the better. Um, one of our sayings at, at Lawrence International um, is, is we, I've played, and a lot of my pro athlete friends, we've played in front of hundreds of thousands of people. When we score to make big, big plays, oh my gosh, amazing. But what's done now, now our goal is to make the ch children feel like there's 100,000 people screaming their names. So with that being the key, all of our athletes come from here all the way down. And we take our resources and we bring them right to the communities in need. And so how we, how we get over the star, how they get over the star struck, and how, um, how that happens and how we bridge that gap is to really focus on the programming, focus on the words. We know that it's there already. We know that they look at us like we're the biggest thing since ever. So we focus on our words, our slogans, and make things clear and concise so that they can really grasp the things over and over again. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Philip, when I looked at the leadership of the organization, 
I, I was wowed. You're, you're working with global philanthropists, thought leaders and faith leaders from across the globe, across multiple faiths. Um, how do you work to bridge the gap between getting work done, personal, personal needs, ego, and setting that aside to focus on the, the goal at hand? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think uh, we're, prob uh, we're probably lucky that this particular Pope is so humble. You know, he, he may be one of the most recognizable faces on earth, but he's so humble and, and so does not carry himself like a celebrity that it's almost easy to make that transition. You know, he, he is, he's, he's so normal and so human that, that, uh, that to make that transition from, he's got a voice, he's got influence, he's got power, he's got visibility, but, but what he's saying is so clearly down to earth and, and, and sort of solutions for the common man. So that, I think that part, we may be in one of the rare spots where the celebrity shine, you know, is, is kind of scratchy on purpose. Um, you know, the, the other part of the question though, it's, it's real, the philanthropists, um, the sponsors, the partners, there, there is that you, you spend time talking about how can we leverage that visibility? How can we leverage the celebrity? And, you know, it's sort of, um, uh, in no way does it discount the, the, the humanity of those people or the value, but that's, it's a tool. That's the, you know, Matt's, you know, Matt's visibility, the fact that Matt knows how to handle a hundred thousand people in a stadium, that's, that's, that's a tool. So we try to use it to our advantage. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Sarah, and I could have spoken for 15 minutes about your backgrounds. It's you know, well presented on the UFT website, and you've done so many incredible things where your background, the impact that you've had on so many could be perceived as really intimidating for someone who wants to you know, get stuff done with you mm. in, in your center. How, how do you bridge that gap and how do you get things done in the ways that you've been able to do it throughout your career and through the organization that you represent at University um, of Tennessee. Well, thank you. I always say um, it's the power of a high five, right? At the end of the day, uh, we're changing lives one high five at a time because the moment we just extend to reach that high five, um, we realize that we're all the same, right? We all want the same basic things. We want food, shelter, a sense of belonging, safety, um, and there's something so powerful about the connection of, of high-fiving someone. So that maybe seem overly simple, but I grew up in a town of 800, Bald Knob, Kentucky. And to think about the power of sport and education to take me from Bald Knob to Baghdad to get to work along some of the most courageous people um, or Tehran or any of the places um, honestly, I find it an incredible privilege to walk alongside the real heroes that are doing the work on the ground, honestly, like Philip and Matt as well. So I think it's all in the power of the high five. I love that. I'm giving each one of you my own virtual high yes. five right now yes. uh, because it's, it's just, it's just in inspiring. And you guys bring so much light into the world yourselves. By the way, is there, is there, is there a whiskey? Is there a whiskey that's made in Bald Knob, Kentucky? It's got to be. Uh, bourbon. <laughs> bourbon. Bald Knob, bourbon. That's yeah. right. Yes. <laughs> that's we're we're, we're going to have, we're going to have a follow-up on the beaches of Turks and Caicos later. With and Kentucky all, bourbon. we bring our own respect. <laughs> Sort of an inside joke. I apologize for everyone else on the call, but that's what happens in, in the pre-sessions when the panelists get together with the Sports Philanthropy Network moderators. Things go a little bit haywire. But talk, talking about high fives, how, how have each one of you celebrated your you know, collective achievements? And on the other side of the question, when things haven't gone right, what have you done as a result of something not going right or the way that you expected or planned. I'll give you a second for that to marinate. 
And you know, Sarah, why don't, why don't you lead us off with that one? Okay, well, easy to celebrate. Um, and, and this has been a habit of mine since I was in college. I played basketball at Virginia Tech. So Matt, I really do wanna hoop it up with you guys. Um, so I played basketball and in that moment, coming from a town of 800 and having the gift and the privilege of sport that opened an educational pathway and since then has opened the world to me, uh, I celebrate by writing thank you cards uh, to any and every person, the, maybe the most random person um, that has made some kind of impact or contribution to my life. And maybe they never knew about it. So I celebrate with gratitude and a handwritten thank you card. That's wonderful. Matt, what, what about you? How, how have you celebrated? How have you? <laughs> I'll tell you. Things don't go Matt, right. Matt does touchdown dances. I'll Ooh. tell you. Listen, <laughs> I'm such an athlete. Right. So like, you know, you, you know, and Sarah, you win, right. Then how long do you celebrate the win? Not like that day, long. Right. You celebrate, but you celebrate, a millis a millis you celebrate, out. right. Philip. Like you celebrate, I celebrate. And I was like, Oh yeah, I feel so good. I feel so good. Like and I, and I let my team celebrate and we all maybe go to dinner or something like that. But then like when that sun rises the next day, when I say it's on to the next thing, it's like, it, it's like it never happened so when you say so when you say when you say like oh like um what are some of your recent accomplishments i gotta think for a minute because i'm just, I have this list of things that i need to get done but we have and so keeping football theme we have first downs and touchdowns and so this will help this will this will help everyone who is on the call celebrate right so celebrate your first downs right your little mile start, uh, milestones and then celebrate your touchdowns because sometimes if you don't get the touchdown on every project you get, you'll feel disappointed. But make sure you have a habit of celebrating your first downs. So all your so when things get rocky and you keep getting uh, quote unquote failure after failure of projects, you don't get in the tank and down on yourself. So we celebrate first downs as well. So with the touchdown, we celebrate, but it's not that long because we've kind of been celebrating mini celebrations the whole time. Now, um, to the other side. Right? How do we? How what did you? How did you phrase it? Well, what what using your analogy? What happens when you someone fumbles and fumble, turns it over yeah, on the goal line? Freaking fumble, um, <laughs> as the coach would say, you fumble. Um, we have to figure something. We have to figure out what went wrong, and we have to come back together. Um, <laughs> and yeah, Eugene, you definitely have to. <laughs> you have to. You got to. When you fumble, you have to figure out what happened. Um, you really have to take a step back and sit down and, 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 and take an honest look at your team. And I have a great team. And so we hold each other accountable, but it's not, if you mess up, you already knew. And if it's out of our control, it's out of our control. So a lot of the times, especially with international sports diplomacy, a lot of the things come out of left field and you don't know. So you really, you, the, the more mistakes you have, the closer you become. How about that? That's something we do. Get closer. Figure out, help your neighbor, get closer, figure out what went wrong. So you, you really look at an a, a analytical view of things, figure out first if it was something internal, figure out if it was something that you couldn't control, then you go from there. And then you you bounce back. Though If you lose, figure it out, move on. Don't don't remember the losses. Like you don't remember some of the wins. You know what I mean? Just keep moving on. Don't go in the tank. That's great. You know, Philip, from your career, I mean, you've worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. And again, I recommend folks looking at your, your, your LinkedIn profile to see some of those brand names because I don't want to consider it an endorsement if I name one over another. But you've had the celebrations and you've had the, the fumbles or the interceptions or the, the three-pointer that, that clinks off the front of the rim. What have you done throughout your career? And what are you doing now within the world of sports diplomacy that leverages both sides of that continuum? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer the question as directly as you're asking it. I'd, I'd say when you sign up for this kind of work, this is hard work. And you almost have to remind yourself to celebrate the first downs because, you know, you've got your eye on the prize, which is, you know, radical inclusion and, and global equality and all these goals that are so clear to you 
but but also so distant. Um, you know, I, I think when you get into this kind of work, you better be prepared for for it's a slog. Um, and and I just but what comes to mind, this happened within the last two weeks. We were having a team call and one item on the agenda was a nice piece of good news. And we kind of skipped through it. Somebody made an announcement. Everybody said, that's great. And then we moved on to the next next you know, big boulder that we're trying to push up a hill. And I said, hold on, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Can we just go back for a second and enjoy the announcement that she just made? Can we just spend 10 seconds, you know, exhale and enjoy? And everybody said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. And we just kind of had a 10 second party on a Zoom call. And then we went back to the slog and the big boulder up a steep hill. But so I, I don't know that it's it's good advice, but the reality is you got to just take 10 seconds and have a little quick party and then and then go back to work. That's fantastic. Hey, can I can I jump in, Michael, just for Absolutely. two things in response please, to Philip? So, Philip, a couple of things you said. Um, you're right. Social change is we're not going to accomplish our goals within our lifetime. And the people generations before us that were solving these intractable issues, they didn't solve it. So we know that we're signing up for a lifetime of never seeing uh, the, the end result that we want, right? But we're going to push and push and push towards it. Okay. And this is not a joke and maybe this is silly, but I use a chainsaw and a weed eater about once a month and weed eat my yard so I can see um, progress. I can see something from the start and something from the end. So I think finding something, if you're in this work of social change, which is a struggle because it keeps you awake at night and it wakes you up in the morning, the good and the bad. But if you can find something that gives you a sense of completion and control and satisfaction, in some ways I've found that to keep me uh, moving in the right direction for whatever that's worth. I, I absolutely love that for two reasons. One is it's going to lead to my next question. The other is I just found out something practical. My lawnmower broke yesterday. <laughs> but I'm going to bust out my chainsaw and go across the backyard to get those clover down to a really good level. Um, Listen, if you need help, more call fun. me. <laughs> if you need help, yeah, it's call a whole me. lot more fun. That'll be a, that'll, that, that will be fun. I, I made can, I, can I quickly play. add something? Yeah, go, go ahead, Matt. I just just kind of went off, you know, uh, Sarah and Phillips said, um, find ways to win at, outside of of your your projects. Like win at the win at the weed whacker. I remember when I went for a, a visit for Michigan State, and the head strength and conditioning coach said, and I was like sixteen, and he was like, every morning I set my alarm clock up for five a.m., and every morning I get up at four fifty-five, and bang hit the alarm clock to start my day off with a win. And I was like, he's insane, what? But then as I got older, I realized the things that were, in, were at stake in life and how sometimes the smallest win and the repetitive and the, just to get in your head that I can win at things. When you have a slump, remember, I can win, I win, I'm not, a, I win. Yeah. So all hell can be breaking off in your life, but you win every day. And that's, I think that's very important. That's very important. It can't be said enough. So thank you, Sarah and Philip, for, for bringing that up. You. And, and that's a perfect segue to what each one of you touched upon, albeit briefly. And we talked about one of the takeaways for those that are going to be watching this, that social change not only do you have to celebrate the personal wins, but the collective wins, you know, social change is a team sport. You know, for those of those, for those that are watching, you know, both live and, and recorded, what have the three of you found to be most effective in building out your teams that are doing such good work around the world? Anyone could jump in. Yeah, I, I'm going to, it's the, the, for me, the easy answer is dialogue, is communication, it's introductions, it's, it's networking, it's collaboration is the, is the goal. It's, it's what we're trying to, I mean, it's what we've set ourselves up to do is sort of 
make introductions, facilitate dialogue, inspire partnerships, and then and and then those people all become sort of part of the mission, part of the team. Uh, that's I, and that is diplomacy again. I think to me, diplomacy. I forgot what your your definition was 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 perfect, but it's communication amongst kindred spirits. And a lot of times it's communication amongst enemies, right? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. It's, to me, that's that the, the team, the team is anybody who wants to help. Let, let me, let me slipstream there for a second, because it, you, you brought up the point that people aren't with you. You know, sometimes there are folks that don't like the cause or can be considered enemies. Each one of you have been doing things both in your local communities and, and globally. How, how have you, and we can get back to the team section in, in a moment, but I think it's important for those to understand what happens when you hit those personal objectives, uh, not ob those personal obstacles, I, I wanted to say. And what about the system, systemic obstacles? Because those are two completely different things, and you may need different methods to go about overcoming them if they can be overcome. That's such a huge question. Yeah, that is. <laughs> that is a huge. Okay, so to everybody listening, right, live and recorded, you're going to get slammed, okay, and everything is going to go great, and. You have to not lose your cool and you have to be very resourceful and very, very resourceful in the time of defeat. When you get that hard hit, that hard slam, don't lose it and focus on the slam. Figure out how you can make the most of the situation. So if you're dealing with a government, a local government, the federal government of a country or, or whoever, figure out once you've been slammed in the position you're in, you're not, sometimes you're not gonna have time to be able to get a big press conference with your team. Like you have to be really resourceful. I'm trying to, it, it sounds so vague. I'm trying to be detailed. Um, you're gonna get slammed and you have to figure out how to still obtain your goal even though it's an uphill battle. You may not have the goal that you want. You may not get the goal that you want, but there's a goal in there. And you you might have gotten farther than anyone else has gotten in that particular region or area, but you don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. So when you get slammed, don't necessarily think that it's a, it's a major setback. In the moment, get what you can get. If you're football folks, you get hit behind the line of scrimmage, get an extra yard. Because when you're because when you're running the ball, sometimes that defense doesn't give up much yards, and you didn't know that. So I, I can't stress. So in the face of adversity, get what you can get gracefully, um, and 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 respectfully, and because because, because that might have that one lie or three lives that you've changed, and and, the, and you thought you were going to change thousands, could have been lives that um, no one in the history of the country or the area has been able to touch at all. So that's what I'll say. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, you, you mentioned that you were doing work in, in parts of the world, uh, Iran, Iraq, and in, in other places. How have you and your teams worked to overcome individual or systemic obstacles mm -hmm. in the pursuit of the groundbreaking work that you're doing in sports diplomacy? Well, thank you. And I'm going to build on what Matt said, because Matt, um, I wrestle with articulating exactly what you were what you were saying as well. And oftentimes we look at it like this, and we say this all the time for those that are that we're working alongside in this work, is that is when you face challenges or pushback or rejection or uh, antagonism towards your work, do not take it personal. Find a way for forward progress. Don't take it personal. Find a way for forward progress. And normally that is by finding the human connections, the things that bind us as humanity. Does that person that's pushing back in Iran because they don't believe women should have the same rights as men to play at Azadi Stadium, which means freedom stadium, but no women are allowed. Why are the men pushing back? So, so I'm not gonna take that personal. 
I'm going to tell the women of Iran, don't take it personal. Let's make forward progress step by step by step. And we're going to find the points of connection. So of those men, they have either a daughter, a wife, or a mother. And I am going for those points of human connection for that forward progress. Wow. That's, that, that, that's amazing. You know, Philip, from, from your perspective, you're dealing with with sports, which is always competitive, but you're also dealing with something that can be perceived as even, even deeper than sports, if you can believe it, which is, which is faith. And as we know, inherently and unfortunately, there can be conflicts when it comes to faith. How have you worked to, again, bring people together when the perception or stereotype is that you know, people are often, often like this or oil and water when it comes to faith and trying to achieve greatness and goodness. Yeah, I mean, in, in a, some, from a practical standpoint, I'd say in a lot of instances, we try to highlight the, what, what we call the values of faith and the principles. You know, it's, it's inspiration, involvement, and inclusion. You know, it's joy, respect, compassion, love, balance, enlightenment. Those are our three pillars and our six principles. Those are all sort of faith-based ideas, but germane to sport. So, you know, if, if we're in a, if I find myself in a situation where I'm, I'm in a conversation where the organized religion comes up, you know, and, and we end up in that debate, um, this is, what we're trying to do isn't about religion. It's about the values of sport and the common principles that you find in, in all faith communities. Mm. Wow. That's great. Um, yeah, just get, gives, gives, gives me pause for a second, just to, to take that in. So thank you for, for, for sharing that. Yeah. Moving on, you know, be, beyond just that, that heartfelt um, comment you made, Philip, you know, for, for each of you, you also may have experienced what, you know, some may call nightmare scenarios or, you know, the unknown known or the known unknown, you know, whether dealing with something globally or locally. How have you as leaders within your organizations uh, overcome those or led your teams to work on the those nightmare scenarios, if and when they came up for your respective efforts. Matt, is that something you'd like to kick off with? I might need to, I, I, I might need to marinate on that for a minute. I like, I might need to marinate. Let me okay. marinate on it. I'll let, I'll let you say, I'll let, I'll let the dry rub soak in. So the, uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, but yeah. on the smoke are going to be, be a little bit tasty. Are we talking huh? about dry rub and bourbon in Turks and Caicos? That's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It's a few of my favorite things, everybody now. And we, we talked about my football team earlier, but we're not going to do that now because I'm going to be embarrassed globally when they, people watch this video. Uh, but, but Sarah, how would, how would you like to address that? Yeah. Okay, will you judge me if I was typing a message taking what Philip said about it's not about organized religion, but about organizing relationships. So can you repeat the question? <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I love that. And I, I think it's something we can put a pin on for this entire presentation that, you know, sports diplomacy is about organizing relationships to bring more good into the world. I mean, it's what you guys are doing. It's what Roy Kessel's vision is, you know, leveraging sports at the local level and the global level to bring more light into the world. But sometimes in order to bring more light into the world, you have to overcome the, the darkness or, you know, the nightmare scenarios. Have, have you ever experienced something like this and either individually or as a leader of your team work to overcome it? Yeah, I'm going to take a stab at that. And, and the reason I am is, is I am 30 years into this work now because of one of those moments. So uh, as I mentioned before, I played basketball at Virginia Tech. I came from a town of 800. Um, it was my ticket to uh, an education that my family could not have afforded at all. So I felt the weight of my community on me. I felt the weight of you know, the sense of responsibility and a tremendous privilege. 
I got there and had one of those old school coaches and she used my weight um, as a super controlling and a very unhealthy way. So every morning at 5 a.m., I was in the training room getting weighed in. But the, the, the interesting thing about it was I never knew how much I was supposed to weigh. So maybe one day it was 140. The next day it was 137. The next day it was 142. So on the days that I didn't make weight, I would skip my classes, put on a garbage bag, go to the student rec center and bike all day because I could come back at two to weigh in again. And if I made weight, I could practice or play in the game. And I was six women off the bench as a freshman. So I was contributing. She wasn't trying to get rid of me. Two years of that, uh, starving myself all day, having to cut weight, working out all the time. And then I developed bulimia. And so after my sophomore year, I was scared. I was in trouble. I transferred to a faith-based school. I transferred to Liberty University to understand that who I am, and for me, it's who I am in Christ. Basketball is what I do. It's not who I am. But when I graduated, I was still in trouble. I was not in a healthy place. I promised my parents I would never have anything to do with sports again the rest of my life. That next year, as I was in the process of healing and all of that, I had this epiphany. Wait a minute, Sarah. Sport did not do this to you. It's what someone in a position of power did. And if she had the power to take those things away, you, Sarah, have the agency and power to give that to people, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of hope. And so that was, that's why I'm in this work, because I took something that was challenging and, and realized that I have agency to do something about it so that other people don't experience what I did. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. I know it may not have come easy over time, but I think your story is important to hear. And it's a reflection of what sports can do to lift people up and make a difference for one person or just your family, your relatives, your friends. But you've been able to take that and empower others and inspire so many um, with the good work that you're doing. Uh, so, so, Matt, you've been, you've been marinating for a few seconds. Do you have anything to <laughs> You, you, you want to add to that? To, I'm just trying to like condense everything. Sarah did so good. You suck. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking more like, it's like who are you? Who are you? What, what are you made of? Right? Like what are you made of? And at the at the bottom, like remember your bottom. Everybody has that bottom out period, right? And Phil talks about his faith. Sarah talks about her faith, right? I mean, I could talk about my faith. I'm an ordained minister. Right. So I did youth ministry for years and years and years. So you talk about teenagers who are constantly at the bottom sometimes and me going back to a teenager and going back, thinking about all through life, like, who are you at your worst moments? Right. That's where we build kind of our core. And so um, after the NFL, the reason I retired from the NFL was because of a traumatic brain injury. And who I was after that brain injury where I couldn't basically stand with my eyes closed for 15 seconds because of the dizzy, the migraines, the, the nauseousness, the, the vertigo, right? The, the, uh, the tinnitus. And my, after all of that, and I can't even run straight without falling over. Like, who are you? Like, how do you get through those things? And it comes back to, you know, for me, it was my faith, right? So, but how can you navigate an impossible situation? Right. So you have to figure out one, who you are on the inside Two, that remember that you're going to get through. And three, you've gotten through 100 percent of the of the awful things that have happened to you. Like you've gotten through. So everybody listening, everybody who has children, nieces, grandkids, like you've gotten through them. So we're not going to pretend like you're not going to get through now, no matter how deep it seems. So just like that bad thing, it's, it's awful. I know I understand some people are going through it right now like it's that time right now like you have to remember you've gotten through a hundred percent of the things you've got through. Now, what i like to say is my god is up is undefeated so a hundred percent so you keep pushing i know it doesn't feel like it now but like in our work we're only as good as our past performance and our past performance is a hundred percent success rate because you're here listening to my listen to all three of us my little conversation with you right now so that's kind of how i I get through things like as far as um, how I navigate. We're it's, it's 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 such a positive outlook, but it's reality. Like you are here. I don't care what situation you're. You're here. Like you're right here. So 
So really understand where you are, no matter what situation you have a path, you have a path forward. That's wonderful. I mean, again, you know, sports has led to where you are right now. And sure. that, and that nightmare scenario is you had, you had a, that awful injury led to doing this kind of thing and, uh, you know, taking pride in it, recognizing it and, and moving forward is hard, whether it's for an individual or for a team. So again, thank you for sharing that background. I, I want to be cognizant of the time. We're at 645 right now. And I, I want to see if there are questions from those that are participating. And one just popped up in chat that I want to want to read to you. And this is from Danielle. And she writes, I'm based in Israel, and I'm looking into ways to use sports to bring Jewish, Arab, Christian, and Druze youth together with the goal of building bridges between communities through sports. Her biggest challenge is that the parents don't want their kids interacting with other communities and organizations that don't see sports as a legitimate educational tool. Now, have the three of you faced similar challenges, and how do you suggest combating the challenges that Danielle described? Anyone I like can raise your hand to go first. I like Sarah's answer. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> um, that human connection, right? You, I like to say you find your your highest common denominator. I mean, when we're playing sports, nobody asks about anything but hey. I'm tired. Can you help me? Yes. That's why we forge partnerships. That's why teams are, that's why teams like with America, the big topic now is like race, right? Race, racism, everybody's racism. Nobody's racism. Or I'm not this. Or, yeah. Well, guess what? There's teams going on right now. Oh, and they're inter, uh, they're, they're, um, they're intermingling races. Uh, and guess what? Nobody's complaining because they all have a common goal. And so to you, Danielle, find one. All you need is one person from that community. All you need is one. Go get the one. You have to work like a dog because they don't want to. But there's one. I promise you there's one. And there's one in every community. And it starts with something small, something small. Then you tell them, go turn around and bring one. So bring one. Just bring one. And before you know it, it'll take time. But it'll start steamrolling. And they'll all. you won't have to worry about anything. They'll do the work for you. The common goal is to play the sport. They'll, they'll form partnerships. And they'll get it done. That's yeah, amazing. I was I was going to piggyback on that. I was going to piggyback on that. And I think Sarah just did in the, in the chat room. Uh, I mean, Danielle, there amongst us, we'll find people that are doing this in Israel. Peace Players International comes to mind. I don't know if you know them. Sarah knows some people. Um, it, it, this, is, this is sort of my, the drum that I'm always beating is collaboration. There, it's being done in other hot spots around the world. So the mo we kind of know what the model is to get these children together, kind of know what the model is to get the parents, you know, sort of to accept, you know, a better way. And, and we just need to put you in touch with, you know, with other people who are maybe a little bit further along. The other thing too, just kind of, I don't want to be a downer, but I, I just, you, I had, I have to make this comment, you know, Matt talked about traumatic brain injuries, which are still happening every day around the world. And Sarah talked about, you know, um, an unbelievably negative sort of bullying experience from a coach. And that's still happening all around the world. And, and now Danielle brings up, you know, this sort of um, resistance to inclusion you know, which is happening in so many, this is what we're all about. Like all of us, we're, we're, you're in this seminar, in this webinar, because you see these problems and, and we all know that we've got to work towards solutions. And, and it, I think more than anything, these, you know, worst moment in your life stories, I, I love that both Sarah and Matt have come out better and stronger and inspired, but I'm equally bothered to know that it's it just still happening, and and we're again we're kind of what we said earlier. We're not done. We're nowhere. We're nowhere near done yet. Mm. Sarah, you, you wrote some moving things in the chat, but can can you can tell us a little bit more about what you've done and the opportunities that you may see for Danielle moving forward? Yeah, Danielle, it was about finding people like yourself in the local community that shared your heart and passion. 
and then sitting down together and, and dreaming up a dream. And it, it's, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, that social change is a team sport and you've got to find your teammates, right? And those teammates are going to look different. They're going to have different skills. They're going to have different areas of passion, but certainly people that want to play the game of peace are out there. And, and it's about getting the right people um, on your team. And we really look at three criteria when we're looking for teammates in social change. What is their passion? And I ask them to articulate that. Okay, how do you define your passion? It's what keeps you awake at night, bothers you, stirs your soul, or it's what excites you about getting out of bed in the morning. So passion could be what keeps you awake at night and what awakens you to, to just go after your platform. How do you see your platform or your place in this world, your circles of influence? Not all of us are going to have a platform like Matt is an amazing NFL athlete um, or a platform like Philip in a relationship with the Pope. All of our platforms matter. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's an elementary school teacher or the Pope himself. Our platforms matter and it's about do people realize that they have a platform and a circle of influence? And then the third is purpose. What is your purpose on this earth for this short moment we have um, in the history of humanity? So passion, platform, and purpose, and finding partners that align and complement uh, what your passion, platform, and purpose is to bring about peace. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. And, and, and for those that, who are watching this that won't be able to see the chat, I just wanted to read Sarah's response to Danielle. And what she wrote is that in 2006, her organization organized the first Jewish, Arab, and Christian girls sports camp at the Wingate Institute. And she actually just spoke at the Wingate Sports Academy, Wingate Sports College, and I'm working with the U.S. Embassy. And as a result of this little uh, webinar we're having today, that you know Sarah has the opportunity to introduce Danielle to her friends and partners that are doing this amazing work. And you know, Danielle, thank you for asking this important question, and for the kind of work that you're doing to bridge these seemingly intractable gaps between people and making sports be the connection to, to, to better the world. Thank you, Michael, for reading my chat. You know, you gave me another chance to talk, <laughs> to add more, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it, it, it's, it's important. And you know, one of the limitations of chat and Zoom is it doesn't necessarily get uh, saved for posterity's sake in the recordings. Are there any other questions or uh, comments from those that are participating? All right, Hear, hearing none, I, I just wanna riff off of what Sarah ended her last comment with, which is the three Ps of passion, platform or place and purpose. And to close this just absolutely wonderful discussion we're having, I'd like, each one of the panelists to talk about how you each arrived at your own three Ps and how they may have evolved over time. And do you see them changing at any time in the near future due to what the world's been going through and what we're gonna be transitioning from? I yeah, I'll start. <laughs> I'll start. Okay, go ahead, yeah, I'll start. I mean, because I, for me, it's easy. If you, I, you've, you've mentioned my LinkedIn profile a couple times, and and I really have spent most of my career in what I would call a traditional sports marketing role. Uh, you know, representing brands who buy sponsorship, or representing sports properties who sell sponsorship. And I got invited to this conference at the Vatican five years ago, really under the auspices of, you know, go find corporate partners who will fund the launch of this movement. And so I was very comfortable in that role. And I attended the conference and spent three days in Vatican City meeting these people who most of which had devoted their careers to what I would call sport for good. So I, again, very comfortable 
you know, sort of in a conversation about the business of sport, but to leverage the business of sport for good, for me, that was it. That was my moment to just sort of realize, wait a second, instead of trying to sell more soda or sell more beer for a brand, what if I could use that, that, the, their tools and their resources and their popularity and their visibility and their distribution channels and, and all of those things that, you know, that I'm comfortable with for good. And so I, I sort of call it, I, I, I say it was my calling. I mean, I just sort of came out of there going, okay, I know what, I know what I'm going to spend my next chapter of my career working on. And you ask, where does it go from here? I just want more of it. I mean, I keep sinking deeper into it and I'm happier and more committed and more passionate about it every year. So I, you know, I, I don't see a lot of change other than to just keep doing it better and stronger and, and in more collaborative and more creative ways going forward. I think that's amazing. When I work with my, my personal coach who also works with athletes uh, around the globe, he says, once you find your calling and your purpose, everything else follows. So thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Matt, why don't we go to you, go to you next, you know, talking about your, your three P's. Passion. One, 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 one thing, it's funny that Sarah, you said that. So one thing we like to say at Lawrence International, one, two, of, two of our slogans, use your platform for a purpose, right? Everybody has a platform. You do. From the, the guy, the CEO to the, to the, you know, the quote unquote CEO mindset to the bottom mindset. Like you all have a unique purpose and you have a platform. Use it because you're instrumental in someone's life, I promise you. I just wrote a, a, a Facebook message earlier today to a DJ, to a police officer who would be a part-time DJ at some of the high school functions when I was in high school 20 years ago to tell him how influential he was and how he was in so many circles. And with me being in a, a philanthropic role, I see the impact that he's made and it's how many lives he saved from his, impact as a police officer so i don't care what your job is use your platform for a purpose and our other one is be the person you needed when you were younger period we all need remember that thing you went through when you were younger in your high school in your college days when that person did you wrong or that coach tried to break you or that person you didn't know really pointed out that insecurity and really dug at it and that didn't sit well with you right be the person you needed at that exact moment. Who did you need? Because you know who you needed. Be that person. And so when you get a mega star, you know, we had Damian Lee from the, uh, from the uh, Golden State Warriors shooting guard, and we had uh, his wife, Sadell Curry Lee. Um, we had them, and that's the mission. Everybody from every profession, they know what they needed when they went through that trial. So well, how do I get there? I go by those two slogans because if I'm the person that these, that I needed when I was younger, I can provide a quality program to where every kid feels empowered. And if I use my platform for a purpose, no matter where I am, people will understand that they're loved, they're cared for, and that they can actually do it in whatever position they happen to be in. And so we give them that so that they can take that next step forward. And they can just achieve their dreams and be their best versions of themselves. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, Sarah, I'll give you the last formal uh, moment or two of our well, I'm not sure I can <laughs> go after Matt. Matt, I feel like we're sharing the same headspace with that, man, because it's so true. I, I, I guess when I look at people, I feel like I have two choices. Um, and again, I'm coming from a faith perspective because it's so important to me. I have, I have two choices. I can point them closer to the love of God with the actions that I take, or I can pull them further away from the love that they know that they deserve and that a God gives them. So I, I have only have two choices in life. There is no neutral ground. I can either point them closer to the love of God or convince them otherwise, pull them further away. And so I see every person as having unbelievable potential. And I just want to serve them in a way that helps them find their greatest potential for themselves going back to purpose. So I guess that's how I look at it. Thank you for sharing that. And 
as we bring this wonderful conversation on sports diplomacy to a close, again, I want to thank the three of you for having such a, a meaningful conversation. And we were able to walk away with a better understanding of how sports diplomacy is bringing change to our local communities and having such a profound impact literally across the globe through the efforts of Philip, Sarah, and Matt. So thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank Roy Kessel and his team and the Sports Philanthropy Network and this conference for having us and wish everybody a you know, wonderful evening, afternoon, rest of the day, no matter where you're watching this in the world and definitely tune in to more of these sessions. You never know where you're gonna find another valuable nugget like this and pleasure to meet all of you and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day.